We know the NBA wants to return in mid-July. We know the NHL is going to be returning sometime shortly. Even football has said minicamp might open up in June. About two weeks ago, it sounded like baseball was ahead of them all. Now what? Let's get into that and more. 97.3 ESPN.com Phillies insider Frank Close. He's one of the hosts of the Powder Blue podcast. Let's get some insight on what the heck is baseball's problem right now. Frank, it seems that they have a clear path to jump out in front and kind of do something here, yet they are seemingly falling behind. What is going on with baseball, and why is this week potentially one of its most important weeks? Well, I think originally the first thing that they wanted to address was was player safety. And they released a 67 – well, they didn't really release it, but there was a 67-page document that got sent to the Players Association that uh, kind of addressed their health concerns. And I think that once the players believed that the proposal was – that was not going to put their health at risk, not put their family's health at risk, then it sort of turned to, okay, well – how do you pay us for the year? And that's kind of what's happening today. So uh, a number of sources, including Ken Rosenthal, of The Athletic, Jeff Pass, and ESPN, they seem to make today the day that, that baseball is finally going to make a formal proposal about how to pay, play the, how to pay the players in a shortened season. And, you know, so far we had some things leak out in the media, you know, talks of a 50-50 revenue split, but nothing concrete had actually been formally offered and so supposedly today is the day they're finally getting a proposal. That has not seemed to leak out just yet, uh, but but this is the first step towards trying to resume play. So it sounds like that they got the health concerns taken care of, and now the question becomes, can we get the finances worked out? So essentially it comes down to the players. We're, we're at where we were about a week ago is, do the players and the owners come to an agreement on compensation. And if they don't, we have no season. And if they do, we'll have baseball. Yeah, it sounds like that. I, you know, it, it's it's hard to imagine that this would result in some sort of strike or something uh, down the line uh, where they can't agree because, I mean, let's face it, there is a great incentive to both sides to play. You know, baseball doesn't want to risk losing their brand, even if, even if it is an immediate financial loss of some sort for, for a lot of teams. Uh, and then for the players, you know, they, this is their livelihood. You know, you have some players, you know, it's easy to think of the players making millions and millions of dollars, but, you know, what about the guy that might have a year or two in the major leagues and, and make that major league minimum and then never play again? So that those, this is a life altering for, for a lot of major league baseball players. And, you know, there is an incentive for them to want to play. And the question just is, well, how, how do you pay them? Now they had previously agreed to play on, on a prorated salary, depending upon the number of games played. Uh, some have suggested that, that they want to stick to that. Um, but, but when that agreement was made, you know, we were all kind of thinking, okay, well, we could be shut down for a few weeks and then we're going to come right back. And nobody was expecting playing without fans. And, of course, that is a major revenue hit if you don't have any fans in the stands. So that kind of is where they're at right now. Will the players give back anything uh, along the way to make it easier for, for owners? Now, let's face it, some, are, some franchises are more comfortable than others. The Yankees probably can make their payroll still, but uh, can the Pittsburgh Pirates? Can the Milwaukee Brewers, you know, think of the smaller markets that don't have the revenue, that don't have the television packages that some of the big teams do. And that's where it's going to come down to. Do you personally feel like the MLB messed this opportunity up? It's a pretty ugly look between the two parties while you have the NHL and NBA, who it seems they're on track. And now when everything does return, the MLB will have to compete with the NHL and NBA playoffs. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I don't, I, I don't know that the leagues were necessarily in competition with one another. I mean, if you look around the country, uh, only in the last week or two is, has there been any sort of wide-scale semi-opening up, you know, with safety precautions in place. And um, I, I think this, this – you kind of got to the point where, as, as Governor Cuomo of New York actually invited uh, teams to resume playing in New York City in terms of no fans and with safety measures – Governor Murphy in New Jersey just uh, said, hey, you know, you can resume your, your, your sports now. So I think before that happened, uh, it's kind of sudden. Um, and we were just sort of in this 
um, lockdown mode and nobody seemed to, to have an end in sight. And, and in that time, it was really kind of hard to figure out how to move forward. So I think that, I think they're all going to kind of come together um, at once for that reason, that there finally is a path to move forward. Frank Close, 97.3 ESPN.com, uh, at Frank Close on Twitter. That's Close with a K. Frank, uh, Bob Nightingale of USA Today reported that the MLB owners have approved uh, a proposal to give players – um, a sliding scale of compensation. So it's not a 50-50 revenue split. It's some sort of sliding scale, which I guess is something that they're really trying to iron out this week. Do you think that would suffice the players? Is that, okay, depending on how much money we end up making, um, you know, under this proposal, the players making the most money will take the biggest pay cuts. Those earning the least will get the most of their guaranteed salaries, which, you know, if you're a minimum paid player, you're going to get most of that. But if you're Mike Trout, you might not get your $30 million. Yeah, that's a really tough one. I, I think from the Players Association perspective, they really don't want to tie their their income to revenues because, uh, you know, as one agent said, you know, the, these are all kind of arbitrary numbers at this point. Nobody knows what they're going to be, and you're basically just projecting. And so you can't really tell to, to what extent this is going to have a financial impact on the game and on their salaries. Um, and, and they also don't want to, to concede in the future that, you know, their, their salaries will be tied to revenues in any, in any kind of way. So I think that's something that they're really they're going to try to avoid. And, you know, something I've talked about before and, and Ken Rosenthal mentioned in his most recent piece in The Athletic was maybe the players would be willing to defer some of the money, but they would still be owed that money. And um, if they defer the money, you know, and by the way, I, I, I want to point out, too, there's still some sort of ramifications to the players because if there's a lot of deferred money after this year, when players hit free agency, there will be less money to go around for those players. So it's almost like it's going to hit the players at some point one way or the other. I get that they don't want to give up the guaranteed contract. They don't want to give up their set salaries and separate them from revenues because that's something they've really held dear. Uh, but I, I gotta, I gotta figure that this is going to eventually lead to some reduction in their pay, whether it's explicitly done right now, or if you defer some money and then there's less to go around later. A few players are pretty open about being unhappy. Blake Snell being one of them. Mike Trout, Bryce Harper chimed in as well to a lesser degree. But how do you think the MLB would handle a situation where big name stars are kind of like, eh, no, thank you, I don't feel like I'm gonna play? Do you think? If they have enough players that will go out there and compete, they'll just say, okay, fine, don't play then, and they will move forward with some lesser stars out there. I think once that there's a union agreement, players are not going to go against that union agreement because they would be forsaking not just uh, themselves, but they would forsake essentially all the little guys as well. So I think it would be highly unlikely for a star player like Mike Trout, like Bryce Harper, who who did have some legitimate concerns along the way. I mean, I think we all want to make sure that Mike Trout sees the birth of his child. That's a very reasonable request and and something guaranteed by the player contract. Uh, but I, I don't see them breaking ranks from the union. They are members of the union, and the point of having a union is to have a unified voice. So I think whatever the union decides, I think it would not be a good idea for a player to speak out against their own players' union because that does a lot of damage in the long run. Frank, uh, what's the deal with the report over the weekend from Jim Salisbury, confirmed by John Heyman, that the Phillies will reportedly train in Philadelphia uh, for a kind of a spring training? So if is this them, first off, are they even allowed to work at Citizens Bank Park yet? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. Now, Pennsylvania, as far as I know, did not declare that that players can train there. Uh, now, um, according to the guidance from Governor Wolf, uh, Philadelphia is set to go to the yellow phase of their scale on June 5th, which generally speaks of limiting um, crowds. Now, one thing that I've, I've seen happen at other things, like for example, um, some of the questions are, well, if churches reopen, uh, is it a set number of people like 25 or is it a percent capacity? Well, I can tell you on that side of things that they're going to let people, whether they're temple, church, mosque, et cetera, uh, it'll be about percentage of capacity. So you could argue Citizens Bank Park and the capacity is 55,000. Uh, it would be no problem for them to train there. And, and they really do have the means to, to spread out a lot, too. Uh, they have the two bullpens. They have two clubhouses. If, if it's just the Phillies staying in the clubhouses, then they can spread out over the two clubhouses. They could probably use other offices. I mean, heck, you know, 
Bryce Harper should get dressed in a hot dog stand if he wants because they're not selling hot dogs. So there's, there's plenty <laughs> of space to, to, to spread out if they want. So I think that I think the idea behind playing there is that they have the ability to, to feel secure in their homes. And if things work out, they'll be able to play uh, like the Baltimore Orioles if they need to scrimmage. They can play against each other. Uh, I think they're less worried about uh, the scrimmages at this point, even though there probably will be some some spring training action. Uh, if, if you know the Yankees, the Mets are in New York, the, the, the Orioles are in Baltimore, it'd be really easy to take a quick bus either way. All right, let's uh, transition over to some Philly stuff real fast. Uh, ESPN.com ranked all 30 teams DH. Philly's last. Uh, so does the DH help or hurt the Phillies? I didn't really think that, – that's kind of surprising to me because, you know, when I think of the Phillies and their options, it seems like they have a lot. I mean, Jay Bruce is no slouch, and he's probably the bat that stands to, to, to gain the most uh, from this, whether it's Andrew McCutcheon resting his ACL or Jay Bruce uh, taking up some space in left field. or You know, you know they're going to be creative with all those types of arrangements, and I think that, that that's not a bad thing. Uh, now, you look at other teams, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the National League East, for a second, the Mets can play you in a is there, perhaps. I mean, but but you know, is he a sure thing at this point? Uh, you know, we kind of look at the Washington Nationals. They got a bunch of veteran players. They can mix and match the Hallie Kendricks of the world. But I I get that they might be any National League team would kind of be at a disadvantage compared to the AL because the AL went and you know they, they put their resources into a player to be a starting DH, and none of the National League teams did when they constructed their rosters right now. So. So, so I kind of get that they would be put um, in a different category, but it, it's really, really hard to say that, what that about, they would be the worst. What about using Alec Bohm there? Do you think that's a, a possibility to start the season and just have him on the big league roster? He would be the DH against lefties, and, and Jay Bruce would be the DH pr- primarily against righties. Is that a potential option? Possibly. You know, I, I think a lot will depend on how they work this this out. Um, I know that I, I did hear in some national level that there was a concern over um, having many of your young players all of a sudden, because the rosters might be bigger. You know, you might have your whole 40-man roster and then some around, and they're worried that players might accumulate service time uh, ahead of their day. So um, if they if they have some wiggle room, you know, Alec Bohm might be the kind of guy that gets to watch for a little bit, and then as the season progresses, maybe they start slipping him in there, especially if there's an injury or something of the sort. But uh, I don't know that they would go that you're a designated hitter. I think they would probably um, have him in the wings a little bit, watch a little bit, be on the taxi squad if there is such a thing. And then at some point, they'll, they, might, they might want to mix him in. And, and it could depend on the, the service time. I mean, Alec Bohm did not get to AAA at all, and he did not start the season in red either. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he kind of rose through the, the system very quickly. So to, to kind of throw that on him out of the gate, I think, is kind of tough, even though – most people believe he's a very talented hitter and, and will be a major league bat. All right, we'll uh, close with this. You know, uh, you just wrote a piece for 97.3 ESPN.com that the Phillies, after 82 games, have been uh, in the playoff mix under uh, Gabe Kapler the last couple of seasons. So if it's only an 82-game season, do we feel that that's a positive? The thing that, that occurred to me there, you know, uh, Jake Arrieta, for example, a, a piece in your starting rotation – that helps the entire rotation, even if he only pitches to like a four-year A, like he was at that point. I mean, he was like, and he had some good starts. He had a couple eight inning starts. He was seven and six last year. And then also too, you know, if if uh, someone like Reese Hoskins, uh, maybe maybe he got tired last year. Uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, you know, at the end of 82 games, he was still uh, still hitting very well. He had no PS over 900. And in the last couple of months, he kind of faded away. Maybe, maybe this helps him get the stamina. And he can just keep keep the foot in the accelerator the whole time. And let's not forget, Aaron Nola struggled early, but then by July, he was in uh, you know top Aaron Nola form. So, um, so those are some things to think about. You know that things that where there are things went wrong, there'll be less time for things to go wrong. Um, now, of course, you don't want to have a player get into a slump at any point in '82 because it's almost like. You know, a three-game slump is essentially a six-game slump when you think about what matters towards the end. But um, but it's an interesting question to go back and think what last year would have been like if that was the 82 games. And then you have to ask the, ask the question ultimately, was it, a, was it poor leadership that led to the 
led to the decline. Um, ultimately, that's why the Phillies made a change of manager. They, they cited the September swoons the last two seasons, and that's why they went in another direction. But, you know, I could see the new energy of, of Joe Girardi in an 82-game span uh, be, you know, something that kind of puts them over the edge. Real now, quick on that, I, I want to I get your opinion. Hunter and I talked about this last week. He asked about Girardi's impact, and I say that being an American League game diminishes his impact a little bit. Huh. That's, that's, that's something I haven't really thought about. I, I mean, he's he certainly managed successfully in the American League. Uh, so that's because he uh, had the best. He had the most talent in the National League. Did. When you have the manager has a role in a National League game, that role is lessened in an American League game. In a, in a way, I think that's a little bit overstated. I mean, a lot of times the the, the double switching and stuff is. Is I think it's overstated at times. I think I think where the manager makes a difference is on the leadership. It's knowing when to give the guys their days off, and and here he can kind of his his, his strategy will have to be the DH, and and he has experience cycling players for the DH to give them days off. You know, a lot of the time that he was in in New York, there 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 was no like big poppy or anything that you know where you were the DH period, and then everybody else played around the diamond. I, you know, there was some strategy to the use of the designated hitter under Girardi, and maybe that'll help them now. But I, you know, I, I mean, he was a he was a National League Manager of the Year once upon a time, but that was 14 years ago. So, <laughs> so yeah. So we'll see. All right, Frank Close at Frank Close. He's got a lot of good Philly stuff up right now, baseball stuff on our website, 973ESPN.com. And, of course, Frank, like all guests, appear via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, Frank and the guys will be back next week with the Powder Blue podcast as baseball is kind of in a transition phase right now. I hope that money doesn't keep them from returning. Well, I think that is the case. I know. But I hope that cooler heads prevail. How bad of a look would it be if baseball and basketball are out there playing and they're bickering over how much money they're going to make? If there's one league to do it, is it not baseball? (laughs) That's true.